There are there are a bunch of um, there are a bunch of biographies and a bunch of history books that talk about Rick Over and and my book is is not one. What I wanted to do was to talk about uh, to put Rick Over in a unique position because I am the only person who actually ran a nuclear submarine around who who talks about how what we did with his with what he produced. And the reason I thought that now was a good time was because of, of what's going on. You have, you have the regeneration of, of China and Russia as, as aspiring peer forces. You have the question of the culture, of whether the Air Force has lost their culture with respect to nuclear forces, whether the Navy has lost their culture with respect to what's going on, went on in Charleston. You have the question of what's going to happen with ship con new construction money. You're spending about 60% of it on submarines for the next five years. We're trying to reconstitute the Trident Force and new attack and attack submarine force. And there will be a lot of questioning about whether, what are you going to spend for uh, surface ship construction. This is the same thing that led to the fights that Rickover and Admiral Zumwalt had in the uh, 70s and 80s when I worked for both of them, when I was dual-hatted and worked for both of them, which was certainly a pleasant time. <laughs> and uh, in addition, you're about to put women aboard new attack submarines, att aboard attack submarines. And that's what really drove me to think about this because when I was, I was CEO of a company of a large company and and a, and a woman one of the best people that worked for me I was walking around the my offices and this woman said to me were you in submarines and she didn't even pause to ask whether for me to answer she said you shamanistic and she did not say pig the her mouth formed pig but she didn't actually say it because she was much more respectful than that, <laughs> which Rickover would have said pig, but she didn't. It, the problem was her first cousin, who was her best friend, had just graduated first from Cornell and was going to become, was the first woman in submarines. And she became the first woman that qualified in submarines. And, and uh, Audrey was, didn't want her, her cousin to throw away her life on this submarine force, which didn't ever hadn't put women in yet, and was certainly going to waste her cousin's life, and she wanted to take it on somebody, and I happened to walk by her desk, and so she took it on me. So Lynn and I asked Audrey and her boyfriend, and and uh, and Janine and her uh, father over our house, and we gave them lunch, and and I tried to to explain. That the submarine for you know each everybody has a different culture each each facet you all know this but each facets of the military each subgroup has its own culture and 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 unique. And the submarine force is a meritocracy. I'm not sure I can't say whether it's more or less than others, but it's a meritocracy. It, it is completely dependent upon your abilities and how hard you work. And that's why Rickover, when Rickover started this in 1948, he had a woman who ran part of his staff, actually ran the chemistry portion of his staff. He recruited women in when he thought the, NR, uh, nation, the uh, ERA was gonna pass. His wife graduate, was a graduate of the Sorbonne, had a PhD back in 19, uh, 2031 when not a lot of women were getting PhDs in the Sorbonne. His second, and when she died of a heart attack, his second wife was also a very accomplished woman uh, who was a Navy nurse. A different approach, candidly, than many other career paths. But I didn't do a good job that day of explaining it. And so I decided I better write it down. And I better try to capture this cult, this unique culture for her and for other people, which I did. 
Oh, I maintain I did. But, you know, being a nuke, I'd say that. In that process, I started focusing on the culture and I started focusing on Rick Over and his leadership because what's driven me nuts, and I've been, I've been a political appointee in Democratic and Republican administrations. I've run several companies. In none of them have I seen the, and Rick Over was probably, in my opinion, the best manager I've ever seen. And if you read the book, you'll see that I'm somewhat on the fence about his leadership abilities. But I don't see other people using the management. And I don't, I don't think many Navy people use his management techniques, candidly. And when I teach, I teach management leadership. I've taught it in universities. I see very few people who are good managers and darn few leaders. And they don't understand, they don't, they don't pay attention to teaching leadership and management. And I wanted to capture that. And I wanted to capture why Rick Over was unique. In doing that, I needed to go back and capture a period of time. And I needed to do it for you, too. And let me take you back for a period to remind you of something. You all know, and I, or many of you know, and let me gloss over this, that in 19, the USS Nautilus was the first submarine in the world, it was the first nuclear reactor in the world, it's the first nuclear submarine in the world, it went to sea in 1954, okay? Soviets didn't have one, nobody else had one, we had one, that's it. Nautilus goes to sea. Okay, great achievement, da, 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 da. let's accept that and let's go on. I wanna, there's a whole story behind that. Uh, two people, I got, an, I got an email last night from one of the, there are two people who were with Rick Over, by the way, on, when he did this. One of them read my book, and died six months ago. One of them is, happened to get a copy of it. He sent me a note last night. The nice thing was he said it was the best book about Rick Over he'd ever read, which is a nice thing to have. I mean, you know, that's just, I was very pleased. But anyway, um, let's go back to what was going on. What happens in October 1957? In October 1957, Sputnik, the Soviets launched Sputnik. What is Sputnik? What is Sputnik really? What Sputnik is, is Khrushchev saying to the United States, I can send a missile which will drop a nuclear weapon on you anytime I want to, and the oceans no longer will protect you, and you are helpless against me. And Eisenhower understood that message, as did the rest of the world. Now what was Eisenhower's problem? Eisenhower's problem is he's trying to recover from spending of World War II. He's trying to recover from the spending of the Korean War. We do not know the Soviets are spending 40% of their GDP for the military. We're spending 12%, we think it's a lot. We have no idea they're spending themselves in the ground. We, our only allies are the French and the British, and yet we know we're engaged in a race to, of capitalism versus communism, and the rest of the world is watching. And how are we doing? Well, Sputnik is up going around the world. Let me review what's going on for you. What is the unemployment rate in the United States? What's the unemployment rate in Detroit, 1957, 20%. How are we doing on launching rockets? The Naval Research Laboratory has been assigned to launch rockets. They've launched four. They've actually tried to launch four. How's, what's the highest 
the best one's gotten off the ground? Anybody know? No, no, not zero? That is a travesty and a nasty comment. <laughs> As a naval officer, I resent that. Four feet. <laughs> not zero, we actually got one of them four feet in the air, the other three got zero, but one of them got four feet in the air. Now, the press, the secretary, Eisenhower's press secretary, who suffers from alligator mouth hummingbird ass problem, has said that we will have satellites around the earth so numerous that we'll have problems with them running into each other in 1958, but we have not managed, quite managed that. We haven't gotten one off the ground. And in fact, we will have, Eisenhower will have to turn to a card-carrying Nazi who has worked directly for Hitler in order to get the first one launched. And if you think Eisenhower wants to do that, you are crazy. But that's what we'll do, right? Okay, so that part's not going so well. How about the Army? Eisenhower's an Army officer, five-star Army officer. How is his beloved Army doing, 1957? Because they're on the front page of every newspaper in the country, by the way, I'll give you a clue. What are they doing? Well, they're in Little Rock, Arkansas, because Faubus has decided that he's going to beat up those little black kids instead of letting them go to school, and he's going to have his National Guard help the whites beat up the black kids. And Eisenhower has had to nationalize the Arkansas National Guard, and then replace them with regular Army troops. And Faubus is on the front page of the New York Times saying he is the new Robert E. Lee that is going to lead this country into the next century. And other people are saying, why in the Army out preparing to fight the Soviets instead of down there taking, doing whatever it's Faubus I'll be doing? So that's what Eisenhower has his army doing. So that's great news. How about the Air Force? What's the Air Force doing that will help him out? Well, the Air Force has decided to engage in an exercise, a nuclear exercise with the United Kingdom. To do that, they've decided it would be a really good idea if they flew one of their nuclear weapons over to the United Kingdom to show them how this is done as professionals. Except when flying across South Carolina, they see an indication which indicates that the nuclear weapon is not actually locked into place. And the navigator has decided to look, to reach down and make sure it's locked into place except the airplane jiggles at the time and he loses his balance, he steps on the release lever and drops that sucker through a farmhouse in, where was it, Moss City? I forget where it was. Let me look. It's in case you're down there. You can go down there and look at the plaque. <laughs> Mars Bluff, South Carolina. There's a plaque. <laughs> and they fixed the house, which was missing three rooms, because the place didn't go off or else it would be missing South Carolina. And we'd only have 49 states. But... So it takes care of Navy, Army, Air Force. What do we have left? Marines. Marines are out at sea with the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing that Eisenhower has is the USS Nautilus. It's the only thing, it's the only thing that the Soviets don't have is nuclear submarines. Now, fortunately for Eisenhower, unfortunately for Rickover, by the way, Rickover's gone out and he's recruited a whole bunch of officers. Because Rickover knows what he needs is, is talent. It's just like any other military thing, what you want is talent. 
Now there's good and bad parts of this, and I talk about it in my book, because it turns out it's going to plague Rick over for all his life. And there are exceptions, I happen to be one of them, which is that the problem with recruiting these guys are, is then controlling them, because some of them are not as controllable as I am. What happens is, he's got a guy named Anderson, who is the second CO of Nautilus, and Anderson, all he wants is medals and glory. He doesn't want to just run around and make Rick over look good. And the president, <clears throat> what he wants, he has his aide go get Rick over, or go get Anderson. He doesn't talk to the Chief of Naval Operations. There is no Chairman of Joint Chiefs Staff. And, and the president doesn't talk to Rick over either. He goes, gets that commander, and he says, you can have him come up to the White House, I want to talk to him. And he says, okay, son, I want you to go on to the North Pole. Now remember, <laughs> Russia is protected on the south by all the satellite nations that they invaded and, 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 uh, caught and conquered so that you couldn't invade it without going through about 300 miles, right, of land. And the first was that, was so that the Marines couldn't get up there. And in the north, on both sides, east and west, it's protected by ice, right? If you've ever done this in the winter, I'm telling you, it's about 120 miles of ice. North Pole is about 1,500 miles of ice. So what Eisenhower does, he tells them to take the Nautilus on that 1,500 miles of ice. If they're going to send a message with Sputnik going around like this, he's going to send a message have Nautilus going on the ice. Nautilus, by the way, is not built to go on the ice. It's the most dangerous thing in the world you'd want to do. And the CNO, when he hears about it, writes Eisenhower a note and says, this isn't in the book because I didn't put it in, but he writes him a note and says, this is the stupidest thing you've ever seen. It's longer than that. It doesn't quite say that. But, you know, we're not going to do this. Sends it over by messenger and Eisenhower says, is that a note from the CNO about Nautilus? And uh, his aide says, yes, sir. And he says, don't open it, send it back to him. Because <laughs> <laughs> President Eisenhower understood what he was doing. Anyway, and, uh, in the book it tells you what Rick Over did, which is really material. And I, maybe I'll get to that. But anyway, it works, right? And then Eisenhower, what he does, he also takes his, pers his personal naval aid and he has him get another submarine and go around the world following Magellan's track from 1648 or whatever the hell that guy did it. You're, somebody's a historian. I think it was 64. Anyway, and what he's going to do is so that when he gets to meet with Khrushchev next time, because if you remember at the time, about every six months or so, they'd meet with Chris, the two of them would meet, and it was sort of like playing cards where they'd, they'd show various aces and kings and pair of jacks and say, I'm pretty cool, you're not, you know, that sort of thing, and they have this, anyway, so that's what he was doing. Didn't even invite Rick, didn't even invite Rick over to the White House when he did. But anyway, what, but what Eisenhower was doing was saying, you may, I may be not able to get you to my army, because you got all that, that 300 miles of stuff, and I can't get you with anything else. But I can get you with this nuclear submarine because they can go on the ice and they come right in your harbors and they will eat you alive. Right? And then he started a building program of submarines, which is the reason why I spent 18 out of my first 20 years at sea. Anyway, it's also the reason when you hear people say, that Rick Over had a charm life and he had all these people in Congress on his side and they can't imagine why he's doing, why he was, had such a uh, charm life. He had a charm life because the presidents of the United States wanted him to have a charm life because the presidents of the United States were using these stupid submarines, right? When I was 36, well, 36 or so, I personally briefed the president of the United States after a trip. Why? Well, that's because I'm, I'm personally charming and really good looking. <laughs> Either that or it's because the President of the United States wanted you know, that kind of visibility. To get underway in submarines, the President of the United States controlled, the President of the United States controlled when I got underway. 
You guys don't know that. All this is really classified time. You know what I mean? You have to understand that. And I didn't have a boomer. I didn't have a big attack. I had an attack submarine. And I was going after a missile submarine. It's on the east of the ice. Anyway, that's another subject. Forgot I said that. Anyway. <laughs> so, but you have to understand, the President of the United States was involved in this sort of stuff. That's why, historically, all this emphasis worked. And it's why these things work. Now, how did Rick over, given all that, and Rick over also worked with really good people, he did, and they were, the, but what, did, what was his leadership? leadership? Rick Orr had three things he worked on. First one was he said, and, and, and there were guys, I was not this stupid, but there were guys who would call him and say, you know, I've got this problem, Admiral. What would you, I suggest I do? And if he didn't fire you for asking that stupid a question, he would just say, do what is right and hang up the phone. That was his mantra, was just do what was right. It isn't follow the written procedure, because whatever, things have changed really fast in life. What was done two years ago may well not be the right answer for what is now. The question is, do what is right. Do what is right is a toughie, right, candidly? Do what is right is a very hard charge. Do what is right I think is a really interesting charge. I once was doing an investigation and um, and I decided a two star, the, the problem that we had that was really just reverberating the fleet was this two star admiral was an alcoholic and nobody would take him on and it was just causing, it was permeating throughout the force and it was causing a problem. And I decided that if I were going to do what was right, what I should do is prefer charges against him and take him up to him. Now, I was, I was no six at the time. And it turned out when I delivered him at his home, he didn't appreciate it. <laughs> but it all worked out and he ended up resigning. And after a while, everybody forgot I'd done that, I think. Uh, and I think it worked out that that was right. It was painful for a couple of weeks. But it's an interesting thing. That was, that was his charge, was to do what was right. The second thing he did, and that was, that was his main charge. He had three, though. The second thing was, if you called him up and let's say he called you and said, you have made an error, and you said, uh, I know, but it was really a minor error. I, f I forgot to close, I didn't follow the rules for closing this lock, but I have, I've been working extra time, and I've done more work than anyone else. In fact, I've worked we were just someplace, Candidly, Lynn and I were, and the guy said, who is not, the guy said to me, I work harder than anybody else here, and I just shuddered to have him hear him say that. He said, but, because people would say this to me when I was in uniform. You know, I work harder than anybody else. In fact, I work more than anybody else. And, and my mother has cancer. And in fact, not only does my mother have cancer, but, but her sister is, has cerebral palsy. And, and my car has, uh, has a knock in the engine. <laughs> and, and I've just done, and I got a, a letter of accommodation last year from the Chief of Naval Operations. And I've just done a wonderful job. And you could, sometimes Rick would let you go on for some time. <laughs> and then he would say, when you went home last night, did you go home to the right house? <laughs> and you say, yeah, I went home to the right house. Wife made pot roast. 
Uh, he cursed a lot, and I'm certainly not going to curse here because I'm not the kind of person, but he would say, essentially, did your wife have cancer when you and your sister and ping in the engine and hadn't slept for two days and you still made it home to the right house? Well, yeah. If you can do all that, why can't you do the little security thing I ask you to? If you're going to do... If you're going to do the stuff right on your time, why can't you do this stuff right on my time? Why is it you only make mistakes on my time and you do this stuff right on your time? Why the hell do I have to, you know, this, you can just see where this is going to degenerate into a situation you don't want to listen to. And it would, it would just go, it would just degenerate. It would just degenerate. And the animal really had a really good sense of humor, but you, you didn't, if you were the, if you were the uh, talky too, you probably didn't, <laughs> you probably did not uh, appreciate that as much as it was humorous to other people watching, who were fools if they smiled. Anyway, but it was a good point, right? Why in the world do you ever make mistakes? And in the nuclear power program, you can't afford to. And that is the culture of the nuclear power program. And in fact, I said in my book, the really interesting metric, I think, is that in 50 years, the Soviet Union and Russia afterwards continue to have nuclear accidents in their forces, and there have been none in the Navy. And that's an interesting metric that there are none versus, I told up 13, 13 in open literature. He had a third one, and you won't like the third one because no military audience does, or semi-military audience or anything else. And, and I won't phrase the way he did it, but it was actually much stronger than this. He, he gave this in 1954 out to, at Naval Postgraduate School. And essentially was, you are not uh, a valuable person if you do not argue with authority to the point of disrespect. And he meant that. He, did, he let his staff do it. He did it. And he lived with it. Now, I have never worked for anybody since that would permit it. It certainly won't happen in industry. And candidly, I haven't worked for anybody in the Navy that put up with it nearly as well. But Rick Overwood, when I was 26 years old and he was, I don't know, 69, four years, I was a full lieutenant now. I wasn't wet beyond ears, I was a full lieutenant. Um, I'll give you an example. Let's, We'll take a minor example, one that it's, it's just a typical daily, day to day thing. One day something happened on the ship that wasn't that good and it made the captain nervous. And uh, we had red phones at the time. So the captain called the President of the United States and he talked to President Nixon and he told him he had a problem. And President Nixon, not knowing a lot about, apparently not being really knowing a lot about nuclear physics, said, okay, I'll look into this. And the President Nixon called Admiral Rickover because Admiral Rickover was the only guy he knew that did know something about nuclear physics. And he happened to have Admiral uh, Rickover's uh, four-star nomination on his desk, so he had, had a name. He didn't call the CNO or anybody else, he just called Rickover. And Rickover apparently thought he ought to know about this before the president, so he calls my captain back. And he apparently didn't like the answer my captain gave him. So he said, where's Dave Oliver? Well, this is not good when a four-star admiral knows a lieutenant by name, but there's a reason. There was a reason. I, what happens is Rick Overt interviewed me for nine hours before he'd sent me there, because there, there were some other problems with the ship. I mean, there were this was not a, this was the first nuclear submarine, the Nautilus, and there had been some problems, and 
Rick over at Cirrus, you know, he'd interviewed me for nine hours and he told me to go fix it. And I would written him back and said, this son of a bitch can't be fixed. It, it's so screwed up. And I'd written it via the chain of command. I'd written 27 pages attached about why this couldn't be fixed and recommended several other people be court-martialed. <laughs> and I'd sent it via them too. Because <laughs> I was a full lieutenant and I had, and I knew I had a judgment to understand this. And uh, I'd gotten an answer back which didn't agree with me. <laughs> Unfortunately, I didn't keep any of these things. I just balled them up and threw them away when they didn't agree with me. Anyway, and I was told to fix it, and they, rel they relieved some of the guys. I have no idea why you knew my name. Anyway, so, Rickover says, I said a bunch of profane things, and then he said, what's going on, essentially? And I said, if I knew what was going on, you wouldn't have been called. I mean, I didn't say that. I said, uh... <laughs> Yeah, I am no, I, you know, here's what's going on. Actually, I said, I'm not quite sure, but I'm going to fix it. He says, can you fix it? And I said, sure. Now, what 26-year-old lieutenant doesn't say sure? I had no idea what the hell was going on. If I knew what was going on, we wouldn't have this problem. Anyway, he says, do you need any help? No, I don't need any help. Same deal, right? I'm 26 years old. I do not need any help. The interesting thing is, Rick, would just accept that. I said, no. And then he said, I said, wait, wait. Now, anybody knows anything about nuclear reactors? There are some people here who know something about nuclear reactors. I said, I would like a little DI water. Now, what happens is you want to keep the reactor core covered. And uh, I thought there might be a reason that I might have some need to, for water. You cover it with water. I said, I need some water. I might need some water. He said, do you want any other help? I said, no, I don't want any of your goddamn help. Or words that effect. It's actually stronger now. And uh, he hangs up the phone. And I go back to work on it. And it takes me eight hours to solve this problem. Because I'm not, there's some fits and starts and some false starts. And I have some problems with this. The interesting part is, we're in a major city. The President of the United States has been called. He's, and I assume, candidly, not knowing a lot about Washington, having only spent about... 14 years there, that probably other people hear about this. <laughs> anyway, nobody comes down to the ship. Nobody bothers me. Except I get a call after about half an hour, and a guy says, uh, Lieutenant Oliver, Admiral York is on the pier driving a water truck. He wants to know, tell you he's going to be up there until you tell him he can go. And I thought, Okay, might as well sit there, because I don't think admirals do a hell of a lot else. I, I mean, you know, that works for me. Um, he was really an interesting guy. And he never, ever said anything about it to me. The rest, I mean, I knew him for 20 more years. And I ran into, I mean, we ran in. we did lots, there were lots of times more that I disagreed with him over really big things where I would, we would end up, we did something once, I'll give you an example, let me give you this example, this, you will not believe this, but it's not even the most outrageous thing I did to him. <laughs> he sent a team to examine my ship, I was the executive, I was not even the CEO, he sent a team to examine the ship, the examine the ship, it was to ch check, uh, and one of the checks was whether or not we had dissymmetry, whether we were checking radiation. You used to have radiation badges where you had this film and you would check to see how much radiation exposure you had. And they had this new deal where they brought film in and your guys would expose it, would, would uh, you know, I suppose, develop it and read it. And so my guys did that and guys I'd personally trained, they did this and they read it and it was out of spec and so they failed us down in Portsmouth, I'm down, not Portsmouth, I'm down in Mississippi, Pasco, I hated that shipyard. And so, and they leave, they fail us. So I think about that that night. Now here is the problem. Here are the options. I have trained this guy inadequately who did it. Well, you can throw that sucker out because I am not, did not train anybody inadequately. <laughs> the film is screwed up. Okay, that's a possibility. 
Kodak or Kodiak, whatever, that Kodak probably could do that. Or it has been exposed wrong by whoever is doing the sources. So we have three different options, one of them is impossible. Right? <laughs> so I go to the, our bank the next day, take out the kids' uh, fund for college, get two volunteers, give them each a thousand dollars, and I send one of them to become employed by Kodak and one of them to go up to uh, Bethesda Naval Hospital to investigate the sources, because I figure that's where they expose it. Guy goes up, gets employed by Kodak as a cleaner, Second night there, he breaks into the files, hy hypothetically breaks into the files. He's just cleaning and one of them pops open. And he finds the files and finds out that they have had a bunch of film that's failed, that they failed and they went ahead and sold it to the Navy and it's our dosage, right? Xeroxes the files, et cetera, et cetera, gets that proof, comes home. The other guy goes to Bethesda finds out the guys exposing it do not understand that radiation is a square, one over a square law. He thinks it's a one over L law. Gets, a, gets you know, goes in, talks to him again, and gets a tape, and comes back to me with the tape. Okay, so I got these guys dead rights. So my CO has gone off on leave after we failed, leaving me to train the true crew, which leaves me in charge. So I write a, a memo, a message to Admiral Rickover, and I document the fact that his guys who are in charge of exposing the film are screwed up. One, they've allowed this inadequate vendor to sell them film that's uh, whatever, and two, they haven't instituted, instituted a proper check there. And so, I did, and so I demand an apology and that we be certified uh, <laughs> that we be certified, uh, whatever it is, good immediately, and, and he apologized to the fleet because my reputation has been harmed. So, <laughs> this is before I mellowed. And so, I get an email. The interesting thing is, so I get an email saying, you're to pick up this guy at the airport. You're going to be re-inspected tomorrow. And I'm really irritated by this, okay? And by the way, I'm directed by name to pick this guy up, which just irritated me more. So I go down and I pick this guy, which is the guy, by the way, who sent me the email last night. And I go pick him up at the airport. He doesn't want to speak to me. He wants to go have a drink. We go in, <laughs> and we go in this place to have a drink, and sits down, he has two vodka and collins. He won't even speak to me. Anyway, and then he says, Okay, here's the deal. I have to buy you, I have to pay my trip down and back with my own money. I have to buy you a dinner. I have to pay for your drinks. I have to sign this thing saying you're certified. And then I go back and I get my butt chewed by the Admiral tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. But I am the guy who controls your certification, not you. <laughs> So this is not an apology. And you are not getting certified. And he goes back. But, and then about a month, two months later, we, re we read in the paper that Kodak got fined $150 million for selling inadequate film to the Navy. So the interesting thing is, I always thought was, you could do just damn you know, anything as long as you're right. As far as we're going. Now, he was never going to publicly say, you know, he was going to control, he was going to keep control of who was the certifying authority. I don't care. But at the same time, no matter what I did, as long as I was right, and as long as it improved safety, he didn't care. That's the kind of guy he was. It was a really fascinating person. And that was not the worst thing. Anyway, I'd be happy to take questions. <laughs> Sir. In the early 1960s in the Command and Staff course, uh, us young guys were there, one of our number was called for an interview in a snowstorm. Yes. 
And he arrived down there. This was when he relayed back to us around the table when he got back. He arrived there and there was a civilian sitting there on a desk. And he started, he, he told him his name and so forth. And this guy started asking him questions which made the hair of his stand up on his neck, all kinds of, and you know, and he really, he lost all interest in being, being part of, of this organization because of this individual. Was there such an individual? There were, you would go in and you would have three interviews with three different people who worked for Rickover, and then you would talk to Rickover. And the three individuals were members of the staff. Anyway, you'd have, you'd have three interviews. They were inter not naval officers? Normally, it depends when they were, but they were not naval officers. They were, normally two were civilians and one was a naval officer. And the interviews, Let's talk about the interviews for a while because a minute, if you don't, the interviews are famous, infamous. And let me tell you what my view of the interviews are for those of you. First of all, you have to understand that Rickover is, was a real introvert, as, as I mentioned. And, he, and there were lots of things that he did which were not good leadership, but the, only because... I don't think you could do them any di differently. When I teach leadership courses, I talk to people and I say, if you want to be a good, if you want to be a leader, you need to learn as many different management techniques as possible and so that you can explore them and find the ones that work for you and try different ones so you can learn how to make them work and expand your capabilities so that you know how to, to, so you become better at using a technique that works with the person you are working with or the people you're working with and the situation. Because you don't want to be the person always using a hammer or only uses a hammer and a screwdriver. Because there are too many people like that, candidly. And most leadership books are written by somebody who doesn't even understand that the, what they're doing only works for their personality. Now, Lynn and I both run really big organizations. Lynn is licensed in six states, ran a $90 billion organization, et cetera, et cetera. We use completely different techniques. She's much, much better at, at, at softer techniques. I understand it. What you have to do is you're trying to learn all different tools to use for different situations. Rickover didn't do that. And he didn't do it. If you knew him, it was, a, it was a great flaw. And what it meant, candidly, was he could actually deal with a, a, the spectrum of people that worked for him. He could deal really well with this group right over here. And this group were those people who were terribly self-confident and could in, didn't need to ever be stroked. She's never going to do it. The rest of the people like this that he really needed, he didn't deal well with all. Okay, and a whole bunch of us would would then spend a bunch of time dealing with our peers and everybody else because you need these guys. And Rickward didn't do it. I mean, it's, it's one of the flaws. But the interview process was really interesting because. It was, it was really a good process, and here's why. Nuclear submarines is the most stressful thing I've ever seen, and Rickover knew it. And the reason he knew it is he couldn't do it. Rickover had failed, Rickover had been an executive officer of a submarine and failed to screen the command. He'd then gone to surface ships and his command tour of the smallest, least useful surface ship, which was a minesweep, had been three months instead of the normal year to two. He'd then gone to be an engineering duty officer, and at the age of 46, 
He had been specifically directed to have no one work for him. So he's in 06 with nobody working for him. Okay? So he doesn't screen for command of a submarine. He gets relief for causing, if you relieve, read his command tour, you could pick a Z, you could at least pick six things to relieve him for, although I haven't seen a relief for cause letter. But you could see him because he couldn't do it. And, and if you read, and he didn't, you read it, you read the things he did write, and he didn't, he has no clue about it, right? And he has no clue about people. And I can give you lots of examples, I could give you, I could sit here and tell you things he'd talk to me where he had no clue. He would do brilliant things and then he would do something incredibly stupid that involved people. Now it turns out, I do not need to be stroked. You understand what I'm saying? I am a cobra about that sort of crap. I couldn't care less. I want to go kill somebody. I don't want to be stroked. You're wasting my goddamn time. But there are a whole bunch of people who like to be stroked. And we all know that, right? And you need them. He couldn't do that. He, didn't, he never changed, and I, I don't think he ever could. But what he did do is he knew himself, and he knew what he was going to ask. We lost, in the 60s, 12% of our officers died. From, that were killed. And we had an ex extraordinary amount of, of suicides. What Rickover knew, what we were recruiting was, we were recruiting essentially all Phi Beta Kappa from the top 10% of the schools. And these are all guys that since the third grade have been told that they're the greatest thing since sliced bread. Well, you know what? You may be the greatest thing since sliced bread, but that doesn't mean that you should go into nuclear submarines. There's all sorts of things you may want to do, but it doesn't mean, my children did not go in and I, I did not want them to go in. They're not built like that. There's been no four-star submariner whose son has ever made it past lieutenant commander, by the way. There's no four-star submariner that I would like to marry my sister. I mean, you know, it's, it's you, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, I, because I'm a nice person, but some of those other guys, some of those other guys are not. You understand what I'm saying? They're just not, they're not the pleasant type of person. That I, right, Lenov? <laughs> See, she, when your wife won't vote for you, right? I mean, uh, she did have, she did, she did approve tapping my phones once, you know, <laughs> okay, but only once. Anyway, what Rico was trying to do was screen those guys out. And they don't want, candidly, you don't want to, you never want to accept that. You know what I mean? And, and guys react badly to that. But it was really for the best purpose. And when I saw that later on, as I got to be more senior, and you try to, but most guys, candidly, don't look guys in the eyes and say, you, go, you need to go out of this. You need to do something else. But you do. I had uh, our best friend, I'll give you, uh, the first example in my first ship was my best friend who was actually a couple years senior to me, but we sort of worked off a, a policy of whoever was best. And he was working for me. He was much smarter than I was, and he could do three things brilliantly. But if you gave him four, nothing got done. And I watched this for a while, I watched this for a while, and I said, you gotta go, you gotta go to someplace else in the Navy. You cannot do nuclear submarines. Well, he did not, he didn't want to accept it. You know what I mean? He, he didn't want to accept that. No, he didn't understand that. And finally, I just, I, I, I moved him. And he went, and he really got upset. And he went to the Bureau, and uh, he went to the Bureau and got the Bureau to give him another chance on another ship. And he was there for four months, and he has a heart attack, massive heart attack at the age of 29. Mm. Right? <clears throat> and when he recovered from the heart attack, he became the maintenance officer at a trailer camp. Because that's all he could do anymore. I had a master's in nuclear physics, and he became a maintenance officer at a trailer camp. 
because he wouldn't listen to me. I mean, you know what I'm saying? What Rico was trying to do was to get those really good guys and screen off those guys who didn't understand how stressful this was going to be and, it, and have them go do something else that was good for their lives. But none of them liked that. between Rick Ober and Werner von Braun? No. <clears throat> Did they know each other? Or come I don't know that answer. I know there wasn't a strong relationship, but I don't know the answer to that. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, Admiral. Um, in regards to Charleston, and is there anything that's being, are we deviating from, leadership, or from Rick Ober's leadership style, or what? I, I don't know the answer. I. I talked to uh, Chief of Naval Operation and Admiral Richardson who told me they'd done the investigation, they believe they have that under control, and they, um, and they are fixing it. I thought it was good, candidly, that when that came out, if you noticed what happened, was the minute it came out, instead of assigning it to a fourth tier, or in other words, instead of having a lieutenant commander public affairs officer talk about it, the chief of naval operation personally briefed it. When, you know, as soon as it came out. Taking responsibility for something like that, I thought it was the right culture approach. You, you just, uh, I really thought John did that right. We will see, right? If that will, we will see. I don't know. I'm not. John tells me he's fixed it. Yeah. Sir. Thank you, Admiral. Thresher and Scorpion were non nuclear causes. Right. But how did the Admiral take these failures? Some, some failures sometimes. I talk about that in a book because. The Thresher and the Scorpion, <clears throat> the Thresher, the Admiral took Thresher really hard. And I took, and I, and I took Scorpion really hard. Let me tell you what Thresher and Scorpion are about. And the, the book is about culture change, okay? Let me tell, let me be very candid about this. The first submarine, here's what's going on. Portsmouth Naval Shipyard is building diesel submarines, right? Portsmouth Naval Shipyard belongs to the submarine, belongs to the engineering duty officers that are building submarines for the Navy. General Electric Boat is a privately built shipyard. Rickover goes to uh, Portsmouth and says, I want to build the Nautilus. And, this, and the admiral in charge of Portsmouth, the engineering duty officer says, no, we're really busy building diesel submarines for the past. He doesn't say for the past, but he said that's what it was. And Rickover picks up his phone and calls Electric Boat and says, would you like to build Nautilus? And the guy said, yes. And so they built Nautilus, so General Dynamics built Nautilus and they built the next seven classes of nuclear submarines. Okay? And they put into General Dynamics at Electric Boat, they put in the standards of nuclear power. It's a different way of looking at things. It's a different stand, right? I'm talking because we have talked, we understand these, this, this, this concept of and Portsmouth continues to bumble along with the concepts of diesel boats. But, but, it is the, but the shipyard, now C, is controlled by diesel boat guys. And they keep saying, we want to get rid of this guy, Rickover, and we want to put in our own guy, and we want to get rid of Rickover, and we're going to, f to replace him with a guy who is a diesel boat guy. In fact, we're going to send him up to Portsmouth and have him take over the shipyard there, and he's the guy we're going to have. It's not we're going to have replace Rickover as soon as we can get. We can talk the Congress into firing him. 
And so they send him to Portsmouth, and then they say, they talk to, and I forget who it was, I think it was, we're going to build the first class of nuclear submarines, because the first seven ships were essentially ones of a kind or small classes of three or four. The first big class of, of submarines, which is going to be the 594 class, we're going to build at Portsmouth Naval Shipyard just the way we ought to build classes of ships. And they give it to that admiral to build at Portsmouth. Okay? And that is the Thresher class. And so they build the Thresher class. Now, Admiral Rickover is technically responsible for just the reactor plant and the reactor equipment. And Portsmouth is responsible for the rest of it. And what NAVC, the Naval Ships Systems Command, has done, instead of keeping control of it at NAVC, what they've decided to do, because they decided to do this in World War II, is they've decided to give out control to each of the shipyards. You can build, you know, a lot of flowers grow. You guys go ahead and build whatever the hell you want to. We're not going to be in charge. We're not going to keep firm control. Rickover does not do this. Rickover keeps control. You build it exactly the way I specified, et cetera. The shipyards are building. Like, the reason I feel so strongly about this is the goddamn guys nearly killed me several times. And you have to understand, I was, in, I was engaged in hand-to-hand -hand battle with these guys for much of my life. Okay. Or you may not realize I feel strongly about this. Um, <laughs> so... Portsmouth builds this. They build the Nautilus, or build the Thresher. Rickover goes out in the first ship of every class. He goes out in the Thresher, goes out, does his deep dive, etc. And, and they survive, except they have some leaks. They have some leaks in the piping. They don't have any leaks in the piping that go to the reactor plant, because Rickover has decided that the way that, the, that Portsmouth puts together piping is unsafe. And he welds all the piping that goes to the reactor plant. But what Portsmouth's doing, several of the shipyards doing, is they're sill brazing piping. Have you ever sill brazed pipe? Anybody sill brazed pipe? Sill brazing piping is essentially you throw some sill braze in and you just pray that it's going to hold together. I, if you've never done it, you, it's one of those things that you have to, you have to like experience. Solder? Huh? Is it like solder? No, it's not as good as solder. It's <laughs> sorry, I asked. <laughs> it, it's it's really hard to check. Is the problem right? It's really hard to check unless you do a radiographing check. You can do it with radiographs, but it's really hard to check because you can get a partial seal which will hold, but you don't know when it's going to fail. In other words, you can get like a twenty or thirty percent check. And it'll hold for a long time, and then it'll suddenly fail. Okay? So, NAVC, everybody know what NAVC is? That's the guys in Washington. NAVC tells Portsmouth to, to, re to radiograph each one of those, ch those uh, whatever I just said, joints before the ship goes to sea. They get, I don't remember the number, they get 18% done to do, they have to take off, they have to take off the lagging and do that. They get 18% done, now they're told in writing, this is not a, one of these things where I call them up and on, they're in writing told it. They get 18% done and the shipyard commander okays, send them back to sea. One of those joints separates, and that's what kills them all. On that cruise? On that cruise. The next cruise. Now, the reason that I feel pretty strongly about this, and this happened several years ago, is many of us feel that that subsequent investigation was covered up. Because the Admiral is the guy who approved that underway. And it was never entered in a record. That question I just told you was never entered in a record, although it was known. 
And that's the joint that failed. And what NAVC tried to say was, since when that joint failed, by the way, it, scrammed, it sprayed water on the nuclear instrumentation and scrammed the reactor. And what they tried to say was that since the reactor had scrammed, that Rickover had lost the ship. Okay? As opposed to saying that Portsmouth's approach had done it. Anyway, I still feel emotional. A whole bunch of my friends died. Okay, that's, that's what happened. Scorpion has stories in the book. It turned out that I recommended something because it was really dangerous, a policy that we carried over from diesel boats. I, I recommended that this be changed because I knew it was going to kill somebody. Nobody would goddamn listen to me. And the guy, all the guys in Scorpion died. I changed it on my ships because I was not about to not change it. Uh, and, I, and you may have figured this out, I ch just do things. And uh, they didn't change on the rest of the ships and on Scorpion they got, kill they got killed. Anyway, who's another question, sir? Maybe you ought to publish your own fitness report. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, do you, anybody know Yogi Kaufman? Remember Yogi, I'm all Yogi Kaufman? I'm all Yogi Kaufman, it's a really good guy. Yogi Kaufman, I was looking there, when I was writing a book, I had to get some dates. Yogi Kaufman had the audacity to say when I was an ensign that he thought that I sometimes should pay more attention to my instructors <laughs> instead of myself. <laughs> and I had not read it at the time, but when I read it, I, I was hurt that he would say that. I just, I was hurt. That's why I was. Do you, uh, do you believe women should be on submarines? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's astounding to me. I had the first um, 30 ships. I had f f some of the first 30 ships that had women on board. Once I got to 30% of the crew was women, the professionalism took a step jump up as well as the um, and the entire feeling of the ship. <coughs> it was astounding to me how much improvement it made. I was really, have I got a couple more minutes? Oh, yeah. I'll give you an example. We're out, um, we went up to Cold Bay, Alaska. Everybody, anybody been to Cold Bay? John, you ever flown out of Cold Bay, Alaska? Close. Well, there's a big there's a big airstrip because we used it to uh, to get supplies to Russia during World War II. There's a big airstrip up there, and we had never take we hadn't been back there since World War II, and Reagan wanted us to go up. We wanted to take all the submarines and take them out of the United States, and show the Russians that even if they bomb nuked the United States, we would still continue to have all our submarines, and we continued to. Nuke the Soviet Union. So, one time, whenever the hell, one time we, t we took all of our submarines and deployed, uh, where the heck, I, I took half of them to Tahiti and half of them to Cold Bay. It was November. So I figured if I went to Tahiti, Linda would not like that. So I figured I better go to Cold Bay. <laughs> and uh, so I, I went up to Cold Bay with, um, with about, I don't know, 8,000 8, people and tenders and stuff and, and, uh, and all of the boomers and I was going to outfit them up there and I was, you know, set up. And I wanted to use it to, I was also, I was having trouble. The previous admiral I'd relieved was, uh, didn't understand women at all. And so he had a pregnancy rate of about 11% and, um, He'd had, he'd had uh, seven officers say they were raped and he had transferred them and had not prosecuted them in. 
And uh, so I, uh, Linda's going to hate it if I use his name, but I didn't like him. And I, so I had uh, taken each of the women and I'd reopened the cases and I'd prosecuted each of the men and brought the women back. And by the time I left in two years, I dropped the unwanted pregnancy rate down to a third of 1%. Anyway, and I took these people and we went out and we went up into the cold and I said, um, but I knew what ha I knew. I mean, I, you actually, I mean, it's just like going to high school, right? And so I said, here's the deal. Machine guns weigh about 120 pounds, right? 120 pounds is separated into two pieces. And an M and an M14 weighs about, um, what, eight pounds? I've forgotten now. But so what happens is, is you don't want, if you give the women, you make the men carry the machine guns, then the men are going to say the women are can't carry the load, et cetera. So you have to understand. You have to be big enough to understand those things. So I said, here's the deal. I want women to carry the machine guns, and the men can carry the rifles. And and then my staff and everybody said, you are crazy, Admiral. They can't carry machine guns. And I said, I'm the Admiral. You guys are not. You will do it my goddamn way. And I will court-martial any man I see carrying a machine gun. Well, they knew I was crazy anyway. So what happens is, you know, they break. So the women struggle off the quarterdeck and out into the snow carrying these, you know, 80 pounds of rifle plus their backpack because they're going to go out. We're going to, we're as Cold War, you know, we're, they're going to go out and establish firing uh, teams to prevent the Soviets from circling around and getting into place. Now I am not stupid. As soon as they get out of my sight and get around behind the camp, the guys are going to say, God, the Admiral is stupid. Let me take that thing, right? You take my rifle. But it means that in two weeks when they come back, there is nobody that can say that on board that ship, right? Because if they say it, I'm going to court martial son of a bitch. <laughs> but it means that they have to band together to protect themselves from me. And they can't take it out on each other, right? And they got to live for two weeks making up excuses and stories to prevent the Admiral from hearing about how they've managed to lie to him. Now, my staff actually did, never did understand. Honest to God, they kept saying to me, boy, I think we should go out there and tell them that you've changed your mind. I'm not changing my mind. I may go out there and look and check. Well, I don't think you should do that, Admiral. I'm thinking about it. <laughs> I had a dumb staff. But you know what I mean? So I did that. And they came back, and I didn't think those women are going to get up that gangway. I thought they were going to break their goddamn necks. Anyway, so we get up, and suddenly morale... It's really working, you know what I mean? And so we go out, see, and, and we get rammed by, I don't know what happened. Something happened bad. And we get in a big storm. And we end up getting an 80-foot uh, hole in a hull. 80-foot hole in a hull underneath the water line. Turns out that's not good, by the way. <laughs> I'm giving that to you in case you've never been on a big ship. But that's not good. But you can fix it. What you do is you take your mattresses, you don't want to sleep anyway. Take your mattresses, you put them down there. You put your shoring down there and all that sort of stuff. And then you can do underwater welding. And this is a big repair ship. Got 3,000 people aboard. Now, my CO wanted to ban the ship. I don't know what the heck he thought he was going to go up there in Alaska. I mean, the bears are much better. Anyway, I don't know where he thought he was going to go. Anyway, so I had, I guess, 80 welders on there. So they get down there, now the water's cold, right? It's about 28 degrees because the seawater is, it's freezing. And so what, you're in the ice and so it's salty. And so it'll get down to 28 degrees and still be uh, not frozen inside the ship. And so they're welding. And so they weld, they weld, they weld, they weld. And one of my big problems on a board ship, which I knew and I wasn't sure I was gonna do it, is the chief welder was a real pain in my butt with respect to women. <coughs> and I wasn't sure what I was going to do besides just take a two by four and hit him in the head. Okay? 
But everybody was sort of worried about dying. And we were, you know, which ship had inclined over a little bit. And all, you know, there was, everybody sort of knew it was this was a problem. And we, we were moving. And after about, after about nine hours of these 80 people being welded, 79 of them had decided they had sort of about had it with standing in the water because it was cold. And I had one welder who made it through the entire eight hours, welded at final seam, and that chief went over and hit that guy on the back of the head and said, son, you are hot stuff. And that kid flew back his helmet, because you get the helmet, and said, thank you, chief. <laughs> <laughs> and my problems went away, <laughs> right? And I'm serious about it. So two years later, we go to Gulf War, and, and General Schwarzkopf, who is not the most ERA person that one I ever met, if you don't know him, comes out and ends up saying, there's two ships that are the most extraordinary ships I've had, et cetera. I want to come out and give them awards. Two ships of, they're the only two ships that were, had women aboard. It's a 30% statistic about par for the course. Uh, it's one of those things where you have to get, you have to get to that point. If you don't get to that point, you end up with, you get groups where you have 20 men and one woman, and that's not good because she doesn't feel comfortable. You need, once you get to about 30%, you know, you always end up with little groups in, in, uh, where you have ETs and whatever. You need to have groups where you always have three or four women in each group. You understand what I mean? Just, just where you, you don't randomly end up with 20 guys and one woman, because that's not, that's not cool. It just, it just works. Humans are not cool that way. It's like high school. You gotta remember you're always dealing with nothing changes from high school, right? <laughs> so 30%, you don't end up with those things. If you don't if you only have 10%, you end up with you end up with situations. I'm sorry, I keep <laughs> you can go on the no, no. Like this. The electrical panel story, I mean, that, that is probably one of my favorites, I thought. Uh, yeah, see, that's what happens when you're old, you know, stories. <laughs> but anyway. Thank you all for coming. Uh, it's an interesting read. Uh, you will be highly entertained. Uh, we're back here on Tuesday. Uh, for a little action in the North Atlantic in uh, 1942, and then next Thursday. Stop just for a second. Let me do one more thing. I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> I, have, I have to show you something really cool which you've never seen, though. See that? That's in the book, but what happens is this is really cool, and I bet, I bet you've never seen this. This says up here, this says, handed to me by Gorbachev aboard Gorky, uh, December 3rd, 1989, George Bush. So what is that? Well, it's obviously a dicked up chart because what it is, it can't be a real chart. It has the Soviet Union as the center of the world, right? <laughs> so what is it? That is what Gorbachev gave President Bush when he said the Cold War is over. His words, according to uh, J.D. Williams, who was Sixth Fleet Commander, were, what, you remember those, uh, that uncle and a brother who were down in Norfolk who gave the Soviets the uh, submarine uh, crypto? Walker. The Walker Brothers. The Walker Brothers did this about 10 years before, and so they actually had all of the submarine crypto. And, and uh, it, does, it sort of doesn't matter if you understand submarines. It, it matters in a way, but we, we talked to the submarines we don't let submarines ever say anything. And when you talked to them, when you commanded them, you would do it in a general way in which you'd let the guys use their own judgment. You understand what I'm saying? So you could, so they, you, anyway. So what Gorbachev said to President Bush was, we have tracked 
we have had your crip we have uh, tried to kill submarines for 10 years we have not killed one we quit and he hands him this chart and President Bush signed it and gave it to J.D. Williams, Admiral J.D. Williams, who gave uh, a copy to me and I, I used this to give all my major commanders because I thought all the guys, you know, really spent a whole bunch of their lives doing this business and gave up this business. I thought it was really an interesting thing. And given George Kennan has said, if you, you know, we'll, we'll, surround, this, we'll surround this beast and we'll let him essentially eat himself and that's the way we'll do this and I thought it was really impressive to see it all worked out anyway I, I just think it's historically really impressive thank you I'm sorry but I didn't I, I didn't uh, show uh, anyway fabulous. sorry I apologize <laughs>